copies and they had been translated into 33 languages. And I've thought a lot about that to th the left behind. Maybe what I ought to do is write a series of books and call it Taken Away. And if I sell 60 million, I'll take us all on a trip to the Bahamas. How would that be? <laughs> and so uh, we're going to deal tonight with the, the brighter side of uh, the return of our Lord, the return of our Lord as it relates to the born again believer. This morning left those who will be left behind when Jesus comes. This evening we want to take a little look at those who are going to be taken away. Now when I study the Bible as it relates to the coming of Jesus and the believer, I find that there are about three main events that are ahead for God's people. Those three events as I understand it are the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, and then the marriage of the Lamb. Uh, I like to refer to it like this. When Jesus comes in the rapture, He will catch us up. At the judgment seat, He will clean us up. And then at the marriage supper, He will cheer us up. So what I want you to do now is to put on your running shoes. And I want us to run quickly now and look at these three events that are ahead for born-again believers when we are taken up. The first one we want to talk about tonight is the event known as the rapture. So I would like for you to turn in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Th Thessalonians chapter 4 uh, comes before 2 Thessalonians. I thought I'd just uh, drop a little theology on you again tonight. And you are aware of the fact, I think, that 1 and 2 Thessalonians are written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to young believers in the church of Thessalonica. At the conclusion of every one of the five chapters of 1 Thessalonians, there is a reference to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now get the picture. These are young believers. They are recently converted in Paul's uh, uh, activities there. He is now writing them back and he is seeking to give them Bible truth, scriptural truth that will help them grow in the Lord. What better truth to grow God's people and stabilize God's people than the truth of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible says, Every man who hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Now when you come to the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, that chapter concludes with these specific words about the coming of the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 16. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. <coughs> Excuse me. Now you will notice here that uh, the Lord lays before us uh, through the words of the Apostle Paul, the basic truth of the event that we know as the rapture when He catches us up. And there are four promises that are given to us by means of four future tense verbs. In my Bible I have uh, circled the, the word shall. That is a future tense rendering here. And he gives us four shalls, four promises around the return of, the, of our Lord. First of all, I want you to notice that there is the promise of the return itself. It says, the Lord Himself shall return. Now you will notice there that it says the Lord Himself shall return. In the Greek language, it is uh, not apparent in the English version, versions often, but in the English, uh, in the Greek language, uh, sometimes the way words are arranged give emphasis. And in the Greek text here, the word himself is placed first. What he literally is saying here, himself the Lord. Now you remember in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus was getting ready to go back to heaven and the disciples had gathered there and he ascended back toward heaven. And the Bible says that there were two uh, angels in white apparel, two men, angels in white apparel. And they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go away into heaven. 
Now that lets us know then several important truths about the return of the Lord. It will be the Lord Himself. It will not be a substitute. It will not be a proxy. But Jesus Himself is going to return for His children. That means He will return bodily. He will return uh, uh, visibly. He will return literally. And He will return personally. The Lord Himself shall descend. We do not know, as I indicated this morning, when that day is going to be. But one of these days, the Father will give the nod to the Son, and the Lord Jesus will descend. Now, when Jesus comes back, you will notice here that it will be accompanied by certain sounds. There are three specific sounds that are mentioned around the return of the Lord. First of all, He will descend from heaven with a shout. And the word there is a word of command. It was used by generals in, in battle to give commands to the soldiers. It was used by the shipmaster to give command to the rowers. It is a voice of authority. It is a shout of authority. So the Lord Himself will descend with a shout. And then you will notice, secondly it says, and with the voice of the archangel. We don't know exactly who this archangel may be, uh, it is commonly believed there are two archangels in Scripture. There's only one mentioned as an archangel, and that's Michael the archangel. But many believe that Gabriel also is one of the uh, archangels. Michael may be uh, heaven's military angel. Uh, Gabriel may be heaven's uh, messenger angel. We really don't know who it will be, but it will be the voice of an archangel. The shout will summon the saints to glory. The voice of the archangel will uh, summon the angels uh, to battle. You will notice in the book of the Revelation that there is a recurrence again of the presence of angels. There is a flurry of activity on the part of the angels in the end time. And so you see, God will break off diplomatic relations with the world, and the voice of the archangel will summon the angels to war. And then the third thing it says, that there will also be uh, the sound of the trumpet of God. And the trumpet of God especially relates to the uh, uh, children of Israel. In the Old Testament, as the children of Israel were going through the wilderness wandering, they had two silver trumpets. And those silver trumpets had specific signals that were to be blown. There was one for assembly. There was one for gathering together for battle. So when the Lord returns, these particular sounds will be made. Uh, when I was a young preacher, there was a lay preacher over there in Marietta, Georgia, near where I live now. He was a, a, a businessman. He was also a lay preacher. His name was F.M. Davis. And he and I did some preaching together. And we preached in some tent revivals and, and those kinds of things. And F.M. was all carried away studying the return of Jesus. And he'd read this passage about the shout and the voice and the, and the trumpet. He was riding along on Highway 41. Some of you have probably been on that very highway. And he came by Dobbins Air Force Base. Now this was in the years when uh, jet airplanes were just breaking the sound barrier. And he'd never heard one of those before. He was thinking about the return of the Lord and the sounds and all of that. And about that time, right overhead, a jet plane broke the sound barrier. Boom! Well, F.M. pulled his car off the, to the side of the road. He jumped up out and he looked up and he said, Is that you, Jesus? And ladies and gentlemen, I personally believe that we are so close to the return of the Lord, I have stopped looking for the signs and I am listening for the shouts. So there is the promise of the return of the Lord. But now notice the second shall in this passage because it says at the end of verse 16, the dead in Christ shall rise first. There we have the promise of resurrection. You see, these believers in Thessalonica were concerned about dead loved ones who had already died. And their question was, as you will notice the context of this passage, what about dead believers who have already died? What will happen to them when Jesus comes? And so here is the promise, the dead in Christ shall rise first. There will be a resurrection. 
Now, did you notice, have you seen in the Bible that every time Jesus shouts, there's a resurrection? You ever notice that? Uh, for instance, when uh, Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus, you remember what Jesus did? The Bible said with a loud voice, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the old country preacher said, if uh, Jesus hadn't uh, called him by his front first name, every dead man in the graveyard would have come forth. And so Jesus shouted, and a man was resurrected. Second time we hear about the loud voice of Jesus when Jesus was on the cross. And the Bible says that, that Jesus Christ cried with a loud voice. And the Scripture says that the tombs of saints were opened up and after the resurrection of Jesus, they walked around in the city of Jerusalem. So Jesus shouted the first time, a man was resurrected. Jesus shouts the second time, and many are resurrected. Now then, the third time, Jesus will uh, shout, and millions will be resurrected. Uh, I don't know how that hits you tonight, but if you will just think about it for a moment, probably many of you are like I am tonight. My mother uh, went home to be with the Lord at the age of 94. Uh, my father preceded her in death at the age of, of 88. And uh, I have lost them to death. And, and uh, death is not a pleasant subject. We, we, we don't uh, like to talk a great deal about uh, the matter of death. Uh, in fact, we use euphemisms to talk about death. Paul did in 1 Corinthians 15. He talked about them that sleep in Jesus. The word sleep is a euphemism to soften the impact of, of death. Death is not a, a pleasant subject. Uh, death, according to the Bible, is an enemy. And, and so we try to soften its impact. A friend of mine called me some years ago and he said, have you bought your burial plot yet? I said, have I bought my what? He said, have you bought your burial plot? And I said, well, no, I hadn't bought one. I'm thinking about renting one. I don't plan to use it very long. Uh, I don't know, though. Maybe Jesus will come. Uh, maybe I'll die before Jesus comes. Uh, if he does, I do know where I want to be buried. Uh, if Jesus, uh, if I die before Jesus comes, I've decided I want to be buried in Walmart. That's where I would like to be buried. Uh, that way my wife, Janet, will come see me two times every week. <laughs> No, I, I'm just kidding. But do you see what I'm doing? I'm using humor to soften the impact of death. Death is an enemy, but oh, you see, that's the wonderful sweet thing about the Lord's return. When Jesus returns, those lost loved ones, uh, I mean, those saved loved ones of yours, those loved ones who have passed on are going to be resurrected. They are going to be raised. And some of you, the last view you had of that loved one was a, of, of a body of weakness. Maybe you saw them and they were consumed by disease and, and you deposited them in some lonely graveyard somewhere. But ladies and gentlemen, I've got good news for you tonight. That wasn't the last view of them because when the Lord comes and the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Isn't that wonderful tonight? Aren't you glad of that? But then here's the third promise around the return of the Lord. It says in verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Now that is, if you and I are alive when Jesus comes, it says we will be caught up together. Now I have said that this is a passage about the rapture of the church. Some people say, well, the rapture is not mentioned in the Bible. The word rapture does not occur. And it is true that the word rapture does not occur. Uh, you, you see, there are many Bible truths that particular words do not occur, but the truth is there. Uh, for instance, the truth of the Trinity. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The word Trinity does not occur. The word rapture does not occur in the English uh, version, but the word rapture is embedded in the statement that I have just read. It says, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Now, the Greek word translated caught up here is the word harpazo. 
and it means to snatch or to seize hastily, to rescue from danger. When they were translating the Latin version, the, the Vulgate uh, of, of the New Testament, the word they used there was the word rapio. And you recognize, don't you, that from the word rapio, we get our word rapture and our word enraptured. So what you have here is a picture of the rapture of living believers. Dead in Christ will be raised first. We who are alive and remain shall be raptured. We shall be caught up together. Now, I like to envision sometime how that's going to be. Uh, do you think about that? How, how will that be one of these days? Uh, let's just imagine here is a Christian family on a Saturday. And, and the son is over at football practice. He's the quarterback of the team. And the daughter is a cheerleader and she's at cheer practice. And dad is out there and he is mowing the lawn. And mom is in the kitchen and she is baking a cake. And then about that time, the Heavenly Father will look to the Son and will give the nod. And the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And then notice what happens. All of a sudden, the sinner snaps the ball, but the quarterback isn't there. He's been raptured. All of a sudden, they toss the young girl up into the air, but she never comes down. She has been raptured. All of a sudden, the lawnmower is running by itself. Dad is not there. He has been raptured. All of a sudden, there's a cake burning in the oven because mom is not there. She has been raptured. Ladies and gentlemen, is that not going to be a glorious day? <laughs> And it says, and then shall we ever be with the Lord. There'll be a glorious reunion, dead believers, living believers, and we'll be gathered to meet the Lord in the air. You see, the Bible says the devil is the prince of the power of the air. And so we're going to have our victory celebration at the very headquarters of the devil. So what's ahead for those who are going to be taken? There will first of all be rapture, a rescue, operation. But now do you have your running shoes on? Let's run now to the second scene and let's talk about the judgment seat where he will clean us up. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And as you're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let me give you two verses of Scripture. If you want to jot them down, it will be helpful. Romans chapter 14 verse 10 says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Second verse is over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 10 where it says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive uh, that which he hath, the deeds that are done in the body according to that which he hath done, uh, whether it be good or bad. The word translated here, judgment seat, is the Greek word bema. And literally the word means a raised platform. It was used for two primary purposes. It was used for a judge to adjudicate cases. It was also used for victorious athletes to come. Now, you know, I, I've got seven grandchildren. Somebody said, uh, have I showed you the pictures of my grandchildren? And somebody else said, no, and I sure do appreciate it. So I, I'm not going to show you all of their pictures, but you know, you got to crow a little bit, brother said, don't you think? And my oldest son is a, uh, on a track scholarship over at Samford University. And uh, they were in their conference meet uh, this uh, uh, weekend, and he runs the 400 hurdles. That's his event. And uh, I got the news today from his dad, my son, that he came in fourth uh, in the uh, 400 hurdles, and he's just a freshman man. Uh, can, can old grandpa just brag just a little bit today uh, about that? Uh, and, and so you see, he, he stood somewhere, somewhere this weekend, he stood at, at a reward stand, a Bema stand, so to speak. Well, you see, the Bible says there's going to be a judgment seat for believers. Oh, no, no, no. It's not going to be a judgment seat to determine whether or not you're going to heaven. You see, that judgment has already taken place 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation, no judgment to them which are in Christ Jesus. 
When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, my sins and your sins were laid on him and God judged our sins in the person of his, sin, his son. And now we can sing that great old hymn, my sin, not in part, but the whole. No, my sin was laid to the cross, but nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. The sin question's already been settled. But there's going to be a judgment seat where we will be examined concerning the quality and character of our Christian life. And you know, the best, uh, the clearest passage I can find in the Bible for that is, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You see, at the uh, rapture, he will catch us up. At the judgment seat, he will clean us up. There will be an examination time. Now, uh, the Bible abounds in beautiful word pictures. Uh, one of the ways to get more out of your Bible is to look for the pictures in the Bible. And here is the picture of a Christian life as a building. You will notice, for instance, in verse 11, he talks about the foundation. Or the foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In verse 12, he talks about the construction. If any man build on this foundation. Uh, you, you see, you've got to have a foundation before you can build a building. Uh, now, I've never been able to build anything. I, I have great admiration for folks who can build things with, with their hands. Some of you may be in, in the construction business. I, I have great respect and admiration. I, I tried to build a birdhouse one time. I, I want to tell you, I may, no, no respecting bird would ever have entered into that birdhouse. It was an atrocious thing. I just don't know how to build. But I do know this about building that if you want to have a strong, sturdy building, you got to have a strong, sturdy foundation. And do you know the reason some people cannot, cannot build a Christian life? They have never had the foundational experience of a born-again experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're trying to build a skyscraper life on a chicken coop foundation. So he said, you got to have the foundation. And then he talks about building the construction. And, and oh, if, if I had the time... You know, if your pastor stays in the will of God and invites me to come back, maybe I'll talk about this sometime. But, but he talks about the different materials. And he talks about uh, wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, that's uh, materials from the devil's lumber yard. And then he talks about uh, gold and silver and precious stones. And, and uh, you see, you have a choice for the things you will put in your life as a believer. So there is the construction, but then there is the inspection. I do know that before buildings can be occupied, there has to be a certificate of occupancy. And so Paul is talking about the inspection of the building. And notice what he says in verse 13. He says, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. What day? The day of the judgment seat of Christ. The day shall declare it. It shall be revealed by fire. You remember in Revelation 1 where the, the eyes of the Lord Jesus are pictured as flaming fire? Now here we are. We are standing at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ with those eyes of fire penetrates and sees everything about our life. The materials we use, the things we did, the things we said. Uh, a lot of things we could deal with here. Uh, one of the things we'll be examined uh, with about uh, at the judgment seat with his eyes of fire will be the words that we have used. In Matthew 12, Jesus said this. He said, every man, uh, every idle word that we have spoken will give an account thereof in the days of judgment, in the day of judgment. I talked about my iPhone today. Uh, our, one of our granddaughters, Ashlyn, was spending a few days with us a few summers ago. And while she was there, I read about young people and texting. A and the article said that the average teenager did 2,000 texts a month. And I asked Ashlyn about it. I said, Ashlyn, do you, do you, do you think that the average teenager does 2,000 texts a month? She said, oh, a lot more than that, Daddy, a lot more than that. Have you ever thought how many words we use in our texting? How many words we use in our daily speaking? Think about standing before Jesus and giving an account for every word that we have spoken. Oh, 
I'll tell you something else, though. On my computer, I have what they call a delete button. You see, in 1 John 1, 9, that's my Bible delete button. It says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know about you. I want to keep things all confessed up to date because if Jesus comes, I certainly don't want to be embarrassed by some of the words I have used. So there's going to be a revelation, tried by fire. But there's also going to be reward. You will notice it says in verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. It will be a time of, of reward, evaluation, uh, inspection, and reward. Uh, the Bible talks about reward. Did you know, according to the Bible, everything you do for Jesus Christ will have its appropriate reward? Did you know that you can't even give a cup of cold water according to Jesus in the name of a disciple and not be rewarded for it? I read a story a number, about a number of years ago. Uh, there was a young medical student and he was selling books in the summer and he stopped at a house and, and it was very, very hot and, and he talked to the young lady there and he said, young lady said, would you mind if... Uh, if I had a cold glass of water, I'm, I'm real hot and thirsty. And so she went and got him a cold glass of water and he drank the water and he thanked her. As it turned out, he became a noted surgeon at John Hopkins. And uh, the young lady he had met there in the summertime at her house had to have some surgery and he was the doctor who performed the surgery. When her bill came, Here's what it said, zero. And then it said, paid in full by a cold glass of water. Isn't it wonderful to know anything you do for Jesus, He will reward you. You, know, you can't beat Jesus. Have you ever thought about it? Jesus saves you and then He lets you serve Him and then He gives you the power of His Holy Spirit to enable you to serve Him. And when you do serve Him in the power of the Spirit which He lays upon you, He turns right around and rewards you for what you do. That's the best deal going. I don't know anything better than that. And so there is going to be a reward. You say, well, I, you know, I don't like this idea of rewards. I mean, I, I don't like the thought that, that we'll be strutting around heaven uh, with all uh, these crowns on, that, that people don't, the crowns of, of reward. You see, the rewards are pictured in the Bible as crowns, as, as Stephanos. If your name is Stephanie, your name means crown. If your name is Stephen, your name means crown. The, the, the victor's crown. Well, what are we going to do with these crowns? Quickly turn over to Revelation chapter 4 and let me show you what we're going to do with those crowns. And you'll notice in Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11, it says this, The four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, in the rest of the verse. You see, we're not going to be strutting around heaven with all those crowns. You know what we're going to do with those crowns? We're going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I really want to have something to lay at the feet of Jesus. But now you've got to be honest with the Scripture. You've got to keep on reading. The judgment seat will be a day of revelation. It will be a day of reward, but it may indeed be a day of remorse because in, Reve in 1 John 3, 15, it says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. In the margin of my Bible, by that statement, I have put this, a saved soul, a lost life. You, you see, if, if we have not lived for the honor and glory of the Lord. If we have built our life with wood, hay, and stubble, as we stand before the fiery gaze of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of those works will be burned up. Wouldn't it be a sad thing to be carried into heaven by the little tugboat of grace with no works, no rewards to lay at the feet of Jesus? 
You see, one of these days, I'm afraid that some believers are going to pick up the charred embers of a wasted life and press them into the nail-pierced hands of Jesus. What's ahead for the believer? Rapture. He'll catch us up. Judgment seat. He'll clean us up. Number three, the marriage supper. He'll cheer us up. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Now, this gets really, really good. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 19, and let me read these verses to you. In Revelation chapter 19, look at what verses 7, 8, and 9 say. Revelation 19, 7, 8, and 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And He saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Do you like a wedding? Oh, all the ladies like a wedding. I remember a number of years ago, my wife Janet got up in the middle of the night, and she, along with 75 million other ladies, I'm sure, watched the marriage ceremony of Prince Charles and the lovely Diana. And then just a few years ago, 750 million people watched the wedding of Prince William and Kate. You know, I guess the closest thing we ever came to a royal wedding here in, the, in America was the wedding of Chelsea Clinton. Uh, they say that old Bill spent $600,000 just on the reception. She had a Vera Wang a wedding dress. Oh, weddings. You know, the Bible has some weddings. The first wedding is in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve and God himself performed the marriage ceremony. Have you ever thought about Adam and Eve when they got married and had a fuss? Do you reckon... No, Adam never could say to Eve, why can't you make biscuits like my mama used to make them? <laughs> and she couldn't say back to him, because you don't bring home the dough like my daddy. <laughs> and then, of course, there was that wedding of Jacob and Leah. You remember that? <clears throat> Leah, uh, Jacob, married the wrong woman. He wrote, woke up and he married the wrong woman. I heard about an old boy one time, and he had his wedding ring on the other finger over here. Somebody said, you got your wedding ring on the wrong finger. He said, I married the wrong woman. <laughs> oh yeah, Bible weddings. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to announce to you that the scripture tells us about a wedding that is literally out of this world. It is a marriage supper that's going to take place in heaven. I, I wish I had the time to go into the background of oriental weddings, how the Jewish people did their weddings I have all that on my CD I mentioned to you this morning. But I just want to point out to you who will be at this marriage supper. Now, the way I've done it, I've done it this way in my Bible. I have circled some words. In verse 7, I have circled the word him to give honor to him. I've circled the word him. In verse 8, I have circled the word her. And in verse 9, I have circled the word they. Blessed are they. That's the three groups that will be at the marriage supper in the sky. Give honor unto him. That means the bridegroom will be there. It is the marriage of the lamb. It is the marriage of the bridegroom. Give honor to him. Now, now you see, it's going to be just the reverse in heaven uh, than it is down here. Down here, all of the attention focuses on the bride. Exactly. I mean, they don't play here comes the groom. They play what? Here comes the bride. And, and uh, all the attention is on the bride. What the bride has on that. Listen, fellas, you, you're just incident. You can be naked. Nobody will know. Well, they all got their eyes on the, the bride. You don't ever read in the newspaper a write-up uh, about a wedding, and, and you don't ever read anything like this. Oh, the bridegroom was just so resplendent. 
uh, at the wedding in his rented tux, in his uh, golden toe uh, socks, and in his uh, Fruit of the Loom underwear. I mean, you, you don't read anything like that. All of the attention is going to be on him in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus will be the center of attention. It's the marriage of the Lamb. It's Him. And then, of course, not only will the bridegroom be there, but the bride will be there. And it says, His wife hath made herself ready. That's the bride. That's the church. The church is known as the bride of Christ. And it says, to her was granted that she be arrayed in. Oh, I'd like to talk to you about the inner garment, the outer garment, all of those kinds of things. I, I, I just don't have the time to, to get into it the way I, I would like to. But she has made herself ready. She has prepared herself. Uh, by the way, I, I know that your pastor raises cattle. But did you also know that he is a beauty salon operator? Did you know that? Your pastor, he, he operates beauty salon. You look at me so strange. You, you don't believe that? Well, let, let me just read you a little something here in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians 5, 25 and 27, it says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Now watch. With the washing of water by the word that he may present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Every time you come and hear your preacher preach, he's, he's giving you a beauty treatment. He's washing you with the water of the Word. You see, he, he's helping get the bride ready for the marriage supper in the sky. That's the preaching of the Word. That's why it's so important for God's people, the bride of Christ, together, together. Uh, he's getting us cleaned up and, and prepared and, and ready for the marriage. You know, I don't know what it is they do to these girls, but on their, I've never, on their, I have never seen an ugly bride on her wedding day. Now, I've seen two or three that came real close, but... <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But do you think maybe the judgment seat of Christ is that kind of final finishing studio? Farmer went one Saturday went into town with his son, and they walked in the bank, and the bank had installed an elevator. He'd never seen an elevator before. And he was standing there looking at the elevator, you know, and, and an elderly lady came up, and she pushed a button. And when she did, some doors opened up, and she walked in, and the doors closed. And in just a few seconds, the doors opened up again, and out walked this gorgeous young blonde. He said, son, go out to the farm and get mama, and let's run her through that thing. <laughs> I'm just cutting up now. Don't, don't, don't. I'm just kidding along. My, my point is this. My point, dear one, is that God is getting His church ready. And one of these days at the marriage supper in the sky, the bridegroom will come in and he'll take his seat at the marriage supper. And then the bride, the lovely bride of Christ, His church will come in and take her seat. And then it says, blessed are they who are invited, the blessed ones. And I think the blessed ones will be made up of the Old Testament saints, those saved on a credit in anticipation of the cross, and the great tribulation saints that I talked about this morning who come from every nation on the earth. Do you see them coming in? One of the things I always enjoy about the Olympic Games is the parade of the nation. And they come in there in their official uniforms and they come in with their flags and, and they come from all of the nations of the earth. Can you imagine in heaven when those Old Testament saints, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of them, and then those great tribulation saints who came out of great tribulation and they all gather together at the great marriage supper in the sky. You know, folks, I think we may be so close to the coming of the Lord, we can almost hear the tinkling of the silverware as the angels set the table for the marriage supper. Now let me close with this. There's a verse of Scripture in Luke chapter 12, if you want to turn there. 
I would not dare have said this myself. I would never have said what this verse says, but Jesus says it. In Luke chapter 12 and in verse 37, listen to what Jesus says. Now, this is Jesus. Jesus says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Now, watch what he says. This is fantastic. He says, verily I say unto you that he, that is the Lord who comes, shall gird himself, make them to sit down to meet, and he will come forth and serve them. Do you see that picture? Here we are at the marriage supper and Jesus girds himself. And he serves us. And the Lord says, here are some bowls of joy. You need some joy. And the Lord said, here are some platters of peace. You need some peace. And the Lord said, here are some goblets of love. You need some love. And the deepest longings and desires of our hearts will be fully satisfied at the marriage supper. You know, we used to sing an old primitive Baptist song, Don, and I suspect that many of you know that song. And there's a stanza in that song that goes like this. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us pray and plead for sinners till our God makes all things new. Then he'll call us home to heaven. At his table we'll sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna all around. Folks, I'll just tell you, I wouldn't miss the marriage supper of the Lamb for 10,000 worlds like this. Okay, you've been real patient tonight, so I'm going to close with this. There's a lot more I'd like to say, but let me just close with this. One of the most remarkable weddings given in the Bible is the one recorded for us in one of the longest chapters, maybe the longest chapter in all the Bible, Genesis chapter 24. That's the chapter where Abraham sends out his servant who is not named to find a bride for his son Isaac. It's a remarkable chapter. And, and so the servant goes seeking a bride for Abraham's only son, Isaac, his unique son, Isaac. And you remember what happens? He finds the lovely Rebecca. And in the course of it, he tells the story of why he is, is there. And he issues the invitation to Rebecca to go to love someone she has never seen. You remember that verse in the New Testament? Whom having not seen, we love and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so the servant pops the question, will you go? Now notice she had a choice. She had a decision and a choice. Will you go? And she said, I will. God has given man a choice. So she said, I will. So they head back now to take her to her unseen bridegroom, Isaac. And the Bible said, this is amazing, the Bible says that there were 10 camels in the entourage. 10, you know, I used to think, Lord, 10 camels for one woman? What's this all about? I heard about an old boy one time that decided to take up horseback riding to lose some weight, and the horse lost 20 pounds. <laughs> I thought, Lord, why 10 camels for one woman? Well, if you'll read the chapter carefully, you will discover that all of the riches of his master had been placed into his hands. And you see, it was a long way to Isaac. The road was dreary and dusty and difficult. And every now and then, I can imagine Rebecca 
would say, is he really as wonderful as you say he is? Does he really have all the riches you say he has? And I can almost see the servant now as he stops those camels and he reaches in the pouches and he takes some of the treasures and he says to everybody, do you see those? That's just a little foretaste of the riches of the man to whom you are going to marry. And he gave her strength. For their, you see, along the way, the road gets a little dreary sometimes, doesn't it? And life can get pretty difficult sometimes, can't it? Isn't it wonderful to know in those times, sometimes the Lord just reaches in. Maybe it's the a sermon of Dr. Amos. Maybe it's some beautiful song that's sung. Maybe it's something a Sunday school teacher says and gives us a little foretaste of the glory that awaits us. They finally get to where Isaac is, and Isaac is out there at, in the eventide. And Rebecca said, Who is that? And the servant said, It's my master, and he just falls off the page. You don't see him anymore. And the Bible says Rebecca lit off of her camel and she went to Isaac. Ladies and gentlemen, one of these days on this old dreary, dusty road we call life, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall be raised first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And Paul said, comfort one another with these words. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for your attentiveness today. You've been so attentive and so kind and so gracious, and I, I thank you so much for it. And I I'm, have a feeling that most of you in this building know Christ as your personal Savior. But if you do not know the Lord and you would like to know the Lord, uh, as we stand in a moment and the invitation hymn is sung, just come to Dr. Amos and just simply say, I, I would like to be saved and he will assist you. If you'd like to join the church tonight, you do that. Maybe there's some of you as Christians and you would like to just come tonight, maybe just have a time here, just kneel right here uh, at the front and recommit your life to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he comes, you will not be ashamed before him at His coming. I'll ask you to do that. Our Father, thank You for Your Word, how it speaks to our hearts. And I pray that You will move mightily by Your Spirit in the invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen. I